I think it would be wise to have your practicums two study guide available during like the first half-ish of this lecture so that you can see in more detail some of the bones and bone markings and for that matter the the knee joint um, when I when I cover them. Well I thought arthritis was at the end of 8a but it's actually at the end of this file 8b uh, still in joints. Now we're going to look at those um, example synovial joints, the, the knee, the hip, the elbow, the shoulder, okay? And we'll start with the knee joint, okay? The knee joint is actually three joints um, that are kind of sharing um, one massive synovial cavity, okay? The articular capsule is present, of course, but it's it's fairly thin and um, it's actually absent anteriorly, so it's it's um, easiest to um, point out posteriorly, okay? The three joints are um, the articulation between um, the lateral, actually, let's do this, the lateral femoral condyle and um, the, really the lateral meniscus that sits on top of the lateral tibia, okay? And the joint between the medial femoral condyle and most directly the medial meniscus on top of the medial tibia, as well as the joint between the femur and the patella, okay? The joint between the femur, the anterior femur, and the patella is a plane joint, so gliding, okay? Whereas the lateral and medial joints, um, those, those uh, joints between the, the femur and the tibia, those constitute Oops, sorry, a hinge joint, okay? And together, even though they're two separate joints, um, they're often referred to as the tibiofemoral joint, okay? Um, little tiny bit of rotation, um, but but once the, the knee is flexed a little bit, but, but primarily flexion and extension, otherwise we wouldn't be calling it a hinge joint. If we look at the next slide, this is a really important slide. I think I'm on three? Four? Slide four? Yeah. Okay. Here's quadriceps. Okay. Making this. Uh, the tendon of the quadriceps. Okay. Here's the patellar ligament, patella to actually tibia, a ligament because it joins bones, not muscle to bone. This is patella, okay, this is the distal end of the femur and this is the proximal end of the tibia okay here's our massive synovial cavity and here actually wrapping into the screen away from us and coming back around here. That's all one meniscus. This happens to be the lateral meniscus, okay. Let's see, what else do I wanna point out here? What's this 
color-coded green guy. We just went over it in, in 8A, so you should know. Yeah, that's the synovial membrane. Is this really pointing at? Yeah, the fi fibrous layer. <coughs> Excuse me. And together, a fibrous layer and synovial membrane constipo constitute, I almost said constipose, <sighs> the articular capsule. Okay. Let's see, what else do I want to point out? Right away. Ah, how about this kind of glassy blue here? What is that? Here's another example of the same. Yeah, that's articular cartilage. Okay, I think we took care of all of the guaranteed features. Okay, now notice that the knee has so much going on that it has multiple, multiple bursae. Now, do I need you to be able to identify this bursa versus that bursa versus this? No. No. Oh, look, it's also got a fatty pad. It's also got, obviously, menisci. Okay, so a lot of those extras, because it's got a lot going on, okay? And I don't know how to, I've already made a mess, so I don't know how to point these out without making it worse. Let me double check to see if there's another place. Where, well, yeah, okay. Within, so, um, intracapsular. Within the, the synovial cavity of the knee joint, there are two reinforcing ligaments that crisscross. I'm going to, well, actually, maybe if I use a gray, I won't intrude that much. So one going this way. That's the anterior cruciate ligament. And then another, let's see, do we have another gray? Yeah, we do. And it this way. Crisscross. That's the posterior cruciate ligament. We'll come back to that. Uh, is there anything else I wanted to modify here? I don't think so. I think we covered it all. All right, let's look at the next slide. We're looking at the superior, or this is the superior view of the tibia, so the proximal end of the tibia, okay? We've stripped away a lot of, of what we just looked at, but what's left behind disc and wedge-shaped meniscus, that's the medial, here's the lateral meniscus. Here's a little bit of our articular cartilage. Okay. Here, coming this way, this way, this way from anterior to posterior is the anterior cruciate ligament, okay? Whereas here, coming from posterior to anterior, posterior cruciate ligament. In other words, 
what determines whether whether the cruciate ligament is anterior or posterior is where it attaches to the tibia. Where it attaches to the tibia. And if it, if it attaches to the tibia on the posterior side of the tibia, then it's the posterior cruciate ligament. If it attaches to the tibia on the anterior side, then it's the anterior cruciate ligament. Okay. Uh, that's all I need from that slide. All right. The knee joint has lots of reinforcing ligaments. Like we could be here all day if we wanted to learning all of the, the reinforcing ligaments. However, I only need you to know a few. I'm only gonna hold you responsible for a few. The patellar ligament, which is not listed on this slide, but we just saw it on a previous slide, so it's obviously fair game, okay? The fibular collateral ligament and the tibial collateral ligament. The anterior cruciate ligament, which we just just talked about, and the posterior cruciate ligament. These are in, intracapsular. Okay, whereas the collateral ligaments are not. They're extracapsular. If the knee has lots and lots and lots of reinforcing ligaments, do you think it's a probably a stable joint or Probably not a very stable joint. Yeah, it's a pretty stable joint. Now, in this next image on slide seven, here we can see medially, because this is the right leg, the tibial collateral ligament, and laterally, the fibular collateral ligament, okay? And then again, here's your patellar ligament. Okay, are there other ligaments? Oh my God, yes. Oh my God, yes. However, we're not gonna label all of them. Okay, next slide is eight. And I have a model of the knee joint and I walk you through it again. I think it's the appendicular muscle walkthrough. I threw it in somewhere. <laughs> uh, and it looks more or less like this. Um, here we can see our to menisci, and actually I'm doing a disservice by, by even drawing on here because this is a beautiful illustration. Um, very wedged and disc-shaped all at the same time. Anterior and, and posterior cruciate ligaments crisscrossing. Criss um, you can see the fibular and tibial collateral ligaments. You can see the patellar ligament. You can see the tendon of the quadriceps. You can see the fibula, the tibia, the patella, the femur. Okay, everything's laid out nicely and, and our model is very similar to this. All right, now let's walk through the shoulder joint. The shoulder joint. Words. <laughs> All right, the shoulder joint is the most freely moving or wildly moving um, joint in the body, and there, therefore you can probably infer it's also the least stable, okay? Um, the articulating bones are the humerus and the scapula, okay? And um, the articular capsule is, again, fairly thin, and pretty loose in order to allow that, that wild movement, okay? Um, lots of reinforcement here, just not enough to make it uh, the most stable joint. So let's look at the next slide, which is 10. Well, hey, this looks familiar. A chromion of the scapula, glenoid cavity of the scapula, there's the head of the humerus, right? We just pointed all of this out in, in um, 8A, right? Got our articular cartilages, our synovial membrane, our fibrous layer to 
together synovial membrane and fibrous layer constitute articular capsule, right? We've got a tendon. I don't care which one, but you could probably infer that it was biceps brachii anyway. Uh, tendon sheath, right? This was kind of our go-to example. A bursa. Okay, again, I don't care that you'd be able to name the the particular bursa. I just want you to, to be able to say that is a bursa. Okay. Next slide. The elbow joint. The elbow joint is actually two joints. It's the articulation between the humerus, the radius, and the ulna, which makes up a hinge joint. Okay. And the articulation between the radius and the ulna uh, approximately, okay? And that first joint includes the bone markings of the trochlear notch, which is a bone marking of the ulna, and the trochlea of the humerus, as well as, and I'm not sure why this isn't on the sign, but it's about to be, um, the head of the radius with the capitulum, capitulum of the humerus. You can't really see all of those bone markings in this image, but um, we'll get. Uh, actually, you're not going to see see it too well um, in the, these slides. But that's okay because I will I will point them out obviously in the appendicular skeleton walkthrough. Anyway. Um, the proximal radial ulnar joint, we actually just talked about at the end of 8A. We saw that really cool fan belt-like ligament that wrapped around the nail-like head of the radius and allowed the radius to um, rotate or pivot, right? Well, that fan belt-like ligament is called the annular ligament, the annular ligament, and it really allows specifically pronation and supination, okay? Now, um, even though it's rather fuzzy, I'm gonna try to point out a little bit on this particular image. Here, the distal humerus is a bone marking that kind of looks like the spool that thread would be wrapped around, or some people see a bow tie. It's called the trochlea, okay? Whereas here, there's another bone marking of the distal humerus. Very, very smooth and round is the capitulum. There's the trochlea. of the humerus, and there's the capitulum of the humerus. Capitulum. Okay. This, gosh, I need to make an end. I'm writing, writing sideways. Is the ulna, and this guy is the radius. So it's the ulna that articulates with the trochlea. It's the radius that articulates with the capitulum, okay? That's not so bad. Okay, <laughs> let's look at the next slide. This is a lateral view. So 
You don't get to see the um, the radius articulate with the humerus, but we can see the ulna, this surface, bone marking of the ulna is the trochlear notch. Okay. I don't need you to know olecranon yet. I just left the label on there just in case the landmark helped you since you already know that the posterior elbow, elbow region is called olecranal. And then this bone marking is that kind of a spool or bow tie? The trochlea of the humerus. And then articular cartilage, articular cartilage. Dangerously tight space. Synovial cavity, synovial membrane, fibrous layer, and together they make articular capsule. We do have um, fairly substantial fatty pad in the elbow. I don't need you to be able to identify this tendon. Here's your bursa. Does it have a more specific name? Yes, I don't need you to know it. Okay. Let's look at the next slide. And I actually, frankly, liked the really simple image that we saw at the end of 8A uh, depicting the annular ligament um, wrapped around. Somehow this doodle that I'm making is going to make everything so clear. <laughs> wow. Um, wrapped around the head of the, the radius. Okay allowing it to pivot. Okay, let's look at the hip joint. Another ball and socket like the shoulder. This time around, the femur, specifically the, the head of the femur, is articulating with a bone marking called the acetabulum of the hip bone very deep socket, therefore very stable and not as um, wildly movable as the shoulder. Let's go to the next slide, which is 15. Oh, actually, let's be consistent. There's the head of the femur. the ball, if you will, and then here's the socket, if you will, the acetabulum of the hip bone. Here's our synovial cavity. What's this? Good, synovial membrane. What's this? Good, fibrous layer and together synovial membrane plus fibrous layer, articular capsule. Nice. Reinforcing ligaments, yes, but tenon sheath, no. Fatty pad, no. Menisci, no. 
a little more simple um, compared to say the shoulder or the knee, right? Moving on, now we'll talk about um, joint injuries, joint issues, um, joint conditions, okay? Uh, the most common joint injuries are uh, cartilage tears, sprains, dislocations, um, I don't know about common necessarily, but bursitis and tendonitis. I would say they're, they're necessarily common. I guess they're pretty common. Anyway, um, cartilage tears typically occur uh, due to excessive compression and or um, twisting, uh, shear stress. And the most common um, site of cartilage tears are the menisci of the, the knee. Um, because cartilage is avascular, it, it, it does not repair well. And uh, often the fragments that, that result from tears um, require or demand um, that, that the patient seek surgery. Okay. In the case of a sprain, uh, what's happened is the reinforcing ligaments or some reinforcing ligaments are uh, stretched overly so um, or even torn. And the most common uh, locations where we experience sprains are the ankle, the knee, and the lumbar region of the, of the spine. A partial tear will repair itself, um, but, but fairly slowly, again, because no vascularization. Um, if a tear or ligament is torn completely, um, there are options. One of them is to simply wait. Another is to uh, graft. And another, which is tedious, is to um, perform microsurgery on the, the, uh, s the torn ends, uh, actually stitching those, those fibers together. Amazing. Dislocation um, treated by uh, reduction, which we established. Gosh, when did we talk about that? Chapter six, I think. Right. Uh, the most common sites of dislocation, shoulder, because it's it's, it's the least stable joint. Um, finger, thumb, primarily because we're using them to, so often, and the jaw. Let's see, is there anything else I wanted to? Now yeah, we're good. Um, bursitis occurs when. A bursa becomes inflamed, um, usually in response to trauma, and uh, it's best treated with with time and and um, ice and and possibly um, anti-inflammatories. Tendonitis, same gist, but but um, this time an inflammation of the of the tendon sheath. Okay. Let's talk next about arthritis. Arthritis is not a condition, it's many conditions. It's an umbrella term. And under that umbrella sits um, more than a hundred different conditions, okay? The, the two chronic forms that you're likely to encounter one way or another in your life, um, are osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. So those are the, the two we're gonna focus on. Um, but in any case of arthritis, the, the, the afflicted joints um, are painful, they're stiff, and they're swollen. Pain and, and uh, swelling are two of the signs of inflammation, by the way. Um, osteoarthritis is 
is the most common form of arthritis. And it's uh, often referred to as wear and tear arthritis because it's it's likely to show up in just about everyone um, eventually, okay? Um, therefore, it's much more more uh, prevalent in, in elderly people, okay? Um, nearly everyone has, has some osteoarthritis um, in, in their elder years. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease, and any autoimmune disease is the result of the immune system um, recognizing some aspect of self as non-self and launching an attack. Different uh, autoimmune diseases are essentially recognizing different aspects of the body as non-self. Okay, and in this case, what's being recognized as non-self is essentially the joint, okay? Rheumatoid arthritis usually has an onset that's, that's fairly early, um, between, between ages 30 and, and 50. And um, both osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis are, are more prevalent in, in women than, than men, but rheumatoid arthritis even more so. Let's look at some of the details for osteoarthritis. In joints afflicted by osteoarthritis, um, there's an enzymatic breakdown of articular cartilage, and therefore the surface that would otherwise be smooth um, of those articulating surfaces becomes rough and pitted and um, uh, irregular and uh, spiky and just like it's, I think rough is <laughs> probably the best term here, okay? And um, this enzymatic degradation uh, happens gradually. So, so these these articulating surfaces are getting are getting more and more and more roughened, okay? As the articular cartilage erodes or degrades enzymatically, um, it's getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and we're getting closer and closer and closer to exposing underlying bone. And um, if we do expose those, those underlying bone surfaces, that, that is likely to cause the formation of bone spurs, uh, thickening, irregular thickening of the bone. Most patients with osteoarthritis uh, report feeling um, stiff when they first wake up. And once they get more active, they, they loosen up, um, usually significantly. The joints that are affected by osteoarthritis can make noise because the articular surfaces, are, which are roughened, are rubbing against each other and making kind of a crunching sound gross. Osteoarthritis can be crippling, but it typically is not. Um, whereas we'll, we'll tell a different story when we get to rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the, the joints that are most susceptible to osteoarthritis are um, those along the cervical and lumbar curvatures, um, those in the fingers and the knuckles, the knees are susceptible, and the hips are susceptible. Treatment usually includes pain reliever, um, certainly activity and potentially nutritional supplements like chondroitin sulfate. Rheumatoid arthritis is initiated by um, 
an inflammatory response in synovial membranes for afflicted uh, joints. And um, those, or I shouldn't say those, that uh, inflammation causes synovial fluid to accumulate and uh, press against the synovial membrane. And the synovial membrane responds by kind of kind of forming a, a almost a callus. Um, it's called a penis, a penis that that is associated commonly with rheumatoid arthritic uh, arthritic uh, patients. That penis can um, erode the uh, adjacent articular cartilage and eventually even erode the underlying bone, okay? Eventually, scar tissue will form and we, our bodies respond to that scar tissue by ossifying it, uh, converting it into bone. And that can lead to um, complete replacement of the joint with bone. So now we no longer have a joint. Um, in other words, the, the bones that, that were able to move with respect to each other are now locked in place. And, and that, that fusion, that ossification is called ankylosis. It is crippling, but that's probably very clear to you. Um, people at, at the onset of rheumatoid arthritis uh, often report stiffness um, of joints, um, but also tenderness of joints. And um, they often will also experience um, flare-ups, which is very common with autoimmune diseases in general. Rheumatoid arthritis can also be uh, coupled with anemia, uh, osteoporosis, uh, muscle weakness, and uh, various cardiovascular issues. So um, potentially dangerous. The most susceptible joints or the, the most commonly afflicted joints are um, in the fingers, so not, not all that distinct from osteoarthritis. The wrists, the ankles, uh, and the, the feet. And what's um, um, at least somewhat distinguishing a rheumatoid arthritis is that joints are afflicted bilaterally, which actually makes a lot of sense because if our immune system is attacking um, the, the joints on our left-hand side, there's no reason why the same system wouldn't attack the joints on the right-hand side. So um, we're, we're typically bilaterally affected by rheumatoid arthritis. Treatment anti-inflammatories, um, potentially immune suppressants, and um, as a last resort, replacement of joints. And in the next slide, we, we're looking at a hand that has been deformed by rheumatoid arthritis. Ankylosis has, has uh, certainly occurred in, in some of those hand joints. Let's briefly talk about Lyme disease. Lyme disease is actually caused by a bacterium, a spirochete. Spirochetes are, are in shape, spiraled, okay? Or at least C-shaped, like the beginning of a spiral. Anywho, um, that bacterium is transmitted to a human host by a tick. So it's not the tick that causes Lyme disease, it's the bacterium, but the disease is transmitted by ticks, okay? And Lyme disease um, often, but not always, leads to arthritis, and therefore it, it falls under that arthritic umbrella. So when I said we're going to talk about two major types, I lied. <laughs> um, if arthritis develops as a, as a result of Lyme disease, it's, it's um, most often experienced in the knees. 
Other symptoms can include um, rash, flu-like symptoms. This is one of my favorites, foggy thinking. Um, however, the symptoms vary from one patient to the next, making diagnosis potentially really difficult. Um, if Lyme disease goes untreated, then the patient can develop neurological issues, um, including uh, an irregular heartbeat. So it's potentially dangerous, which is sad because it can be treated. Um, it's treated by, by, with antibiotics, however, an especially long course of antibiotics. And that is the end of chapter, what are we in? Chapter eight, I think. I'm sure you gathered that I'm outside, but I just have to document this day. Oh, oh and so does Paisley. <laughs> uh, it's early fall, mid 60s, not a cloud in the sky. Some of the leaves are changing color. It's just gorgeous. So grateful to have days like these. <laughs>